And these days, I must admit that I don't watch cricket matches, uh, except that yesterday it was worth watching the last over. <laughs> For that alone, it was worth it. Uh, having said that, I made a small change. It's knowledge of the ancient in ancient times rather than since the ancient times because I thought that that was too broad a canvas for me to cover. Uh, you know, we all know about the close relationship between elephants and people over such a long time period. And uh, we should ask ourselves a question as to, you know, what did the ancient people really know about the elephant? You know, was it all mythology? I mean, all that they knew about the elephant was it all sort of myth and something that can be dismissed by us, uh, you know, who. Uh, claim to be superior scientists, you know, being very objective about looking at, uh, you know, the elephant uh, and so on and so forth. Or are there glimpses of uh, truth and fact and uh, so, is there something that we can learn from the ancients about their knowledge of the elephant? Uh, I'll very quickly go through this. I will not make a formal presentation in the tradition of the social sciences <laughs> or a historian, but uh, through a PowerPoint presentation like this. Uh, of course, the artistic depictions that Shibani referred to, the rock art and, you know, a lot of sculptural uh, depiction of the elephant, paintings and so on, they do tell us a lot about the elephant and about what people thought about the elephant. Uh, but largely today I'll confine myself to the texts, you know, the Vedas, the two great epics, the Greek texts, the Chatakas, other Buddhist sources, the Sangam poetry, Palkapya's Gajasastra, you know, or Hasti Ayurveda, which is a, a masterpiece I really consider in ancient knowledge of the elephant. Uh, Kautilya Arthasastra, Manasalosa, this thing. Uh, Hasti Vidyarnava is a fairly more recent, it's only about three or four hundred years old, written by my uh, my namesake in Assam, uh, Akbar Nama and Aini Akbari, of course, uh, the uh, uh, from the uh, time of the Mughal Emperor. Okay, now, obviously, as evolutionary biologists, you know, we have a tradition of evolutionary biology in this department. So, we have to dismiss the, the first two paragraphs here, or three paragraphs here, that the origin of elephants is traced to a cosmic event and blah, blah, blah. Okay, that is the, the myth of the elephant. Okay, but let me point out uh, the last part to you, and that is Brahma created elephants for the profit of offering sacrifices to the gods, and especially for the welfare of kings. I think that's a very significant statement, because I think here is where you have the theoretical underpinnings of the entire elephant culture that arose in Asia. Okay, and this uh, this single statement here, I, I do not know if others have recognized the significance of the statement that uh, you know the elephants were created especially for the welfare of kings. Because almost, uh, you know, throughout this uh, uh, historical, whatever, 2,000, 3,000 years of uh, very close relationship between elephants and people, uh, if there is one, um, you know, reason why we have had this close relationship that has sort of driven this entire relationship, it is the fact that uh, elephants were useful in the armies of kings over such a long time period, okay. You also had the African elephant that played a brief role in the armies of, you know, of, uh, you know, battles in Europe and so on. Uh, as per, you know, in Northern Africa and in Southern Europe. Uh, but after that, uh, you know, it's never had this such a long duration in terms of a relationship where uh, for at least uh, 2,500 years or maybe even more, the elephant has been uh, uh, used as an uh, instrument of war. And uh, I have uh, written about this earlier. And I think that's really the reason uh, why the elephant was elevated to sacred status, first in Buddhism, by the way, and not in Hinduism and then as a white elephant and later in Brahminical Hinduism as, as Ganesha. Okay, now what did the ancients know about the elephants? Okay, uh, and I'll just quickly run through some, some aspects of this. Um, if you look at uh, the status and distribution of elephants, okay, you have the Ramayana which states that elephants at Ayodhya, that were found in Ayodhya, uh, these are captive elephants obviously, uh, they were born in the Vindhya and the Himalaya. Okay, nothing in between really, uh, which is actually probably uh, very uh, telling because even today you have elephant distribution along the Himalayan foothills and then you have, uh, you know, during historical times we have had the elephants in the Vindhyas and to the south of the Vindhyas. Now the Indo-Gangetic Basin was, uh, uh, has been settled and, and cleared off uh, wild elephants, you know, quite a long time ago. And therefore, uh, uh, also the Ramayana, say, uh, you know, refers to the increasing use of elephants in the armies of the south, the Ramana's army, for instance, has more elephants than Rama's army. Okay. So, is this indicative of a larger population of elephants, you know, being found south of the, of the Vindhyas, you know, in the peninsula of India, where uh, perhaps uh, the settlements had not gone to such an extent as you have in the indo gangetic Basin by this time, uh, during the first millennium uh, BCE, and therefore you had uh, much larger populations of elephants, which then the local tribes and, you know, other chieftains and so on you had actually used as an instrument of war. 
Um, that is uh, in the uh, uh, Atariya Brahmana of the 7th century BC, uh, uh, the ruler of Anga, he gives 10,000 tusked elephants. Obviously, this is an exa exaggerated figure on the occasion of the Ashwamedha Yagna, where the horse is sacrificed, the horse sacrifice. And uh, Anga refers to the present day Bihar or Jharkhand, you know, it's been split into two states today. So, even if 10,000 tusked elephants is uh, exaggerated, okay, even if it's a few hundred elephants, still. This clearly indicates that present-day Bihar, Jharkhand had a very large population of elephants. Okay. So, there is something that we can glean from this that there were lots of elephants over there. And then uh, Shivani again mentioned the Jatakas and uh, there are some very interesting references to the elephants and their behavior and their distribution, their population status and so on of the Jatakas. I just can't help uh, projecting this uh, uh, painting which is my favorite painting of all times, you know, of the elephant. This is the, you know, the Chattanta Jataka. Uh, the, you know, you should actually see this painting in Ajakta to be able to really appreciate the significance of this. This is my favorite uh, painting of all times, which is just a part of a much larger mural that covers uh, an area which is about uh, perhaps, uh, I would say, larger than half, half, half this wall over here. Uh, I'm not going, going to go into the Chaddanta uh, Jataka itself, but uh, the uh, Jatakas refer to the Bodhisattva as a leader of a great herd of 8,000 elephants. Kasava Jataka, or in, in one instance, 80,000 elephants in the Himalaya. Okay. So, here the Jatakas speak about large populations of elephants in the Himalaya. Now, of course, you might wonder, you know, 8,000 elephants, it says, the Bodhisattva is the leader of a great herd of 8,000 elephants in one place. Now, 80,000 elephants, they don't seem to gel. But let me tell you that this is probably the, of the right order of magnitude. There would have been somewhere you know, maybe 8,000, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 elephants. There can't be 8, 800,000 elephants there. There can't be 800, only 800 elephants in Himalaya. So it's roughly of the same order of magnitude. And as a practicing ecologist, you know, who does a lot of statistical models and so on, let me tell you that uh, statistical confidence limits, if you take uh, an estimate of 30,000 elephants, uh, plus or minus 60% uh, or whatever, you know, or, you know, or 95% confidence limits, statistical confidence limits, it's not too too wide off the mark. I mean, even today when we go and actually make population estimates, we come up with estimates that are very, very wide. Not necessarily better than what you get from here on, on most occasions. Okay. So, I would say that this gives you an indication of the size of the, size of the elephant population. Somewhere in the several thousands, you know, almost certainly more than 10,000, maybe less than 100,000. This is the kind of status of elephants that you had in the, in the Himalayan region. Now, of course, when we come to the distribution of elephants, where elephants were found, and uh, this is a map, uh, we are missing uh, uh, Tom Trotman, who wrote this paper in 1982, where based on the description of the Gajavanas or the elephant forests in the Kautilya Arthasastra, now, I know that uh, the uh, dating of the Kautilya Arthasastra is problematic. I have gone with the conventional scholarship of dating it between 300 BC and 300 CE, that is from the Mauryan times to, you know, uh, the, the, about 300 CE or so. Uh, more recent scholarship seems to suggest Patrick Olliwell, again, uh, whom P.S. Locke knows, we had a wonderful meeting in uh, New Zealand a few years ago. He has done a new translation of the Arthashastra and I was talking to him and he said that no, Arthashastra is much more recent and so on. I will try to argue that the Arthashastra is a little older based on this uh, on this distribution. It lists the Gajavanas, elephant forests, you know, in, in the Mauryan Empire. Okay. Now, it lists these eight vanas. So you have the Prachyavana, the Kalingavana, the Chedi Karusavana, and so on and so forth. And they are actually listed, like they are given here. The distributions are mapped by Thomas Trotman. Now, interestingly, you will see that the range of the elephant does not extend to the extreme south of the country. It doesn't come to the south. So you will find that there are no elephants, uh, there are no elephants, you know, described here. But we know that today, that the largest elephant populations are, are actually found here. You know, in the states of Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, the single largest population, global population of the Asian elephant is actually found here today. All right. So, it doesn't. But this is not very surprising really because I would argue that the Mauryan Empire actually stopped here. The Mauryan Empire, the distribution of the southern limit of the Mauryan Empire was somewhere roughly here. They had no knowledge of the elephant to the south of the moon. Therefore, I would really argue that the Arthasastra, the description of the elephant forest in the Arthasastra goes back to the Mauryan times. It can't be from too much of a later period when people would definitely have had knowledge of elephants of the south. There's another interesting thing that I uh, I would argue from uh, the description of the elephant forest. 
when uh, uh, when uh, uh, Kautilya describes the elephant forest, he says that the Saurashtravana and the Panchanandavana are mentioned as the worst for elephants. Worst for what elephants? For producing elephants that are fit for use in battle. You know, the Kumaria elephants, the robustly built elephants, the tusked elephants that could be captured and used in war. Okay. Now, this is again not very surprising because where are these two vanas? The Saurashtra vana is here, right? It's an arid zone of the country and uh, the, the Panchanada vana is over here. Now, elephants had practically disappeared by that time, you know, from these regions. By about uh, 2300 years ago or 2000 years ago, whenever you want to date the Arthashastra, I would argue that the elephant had actually virtually disappeared from this area. These are extremely arid zones of the country. They are not really good for producing elephants. But on the other hand, the Kalinga vana is listed as being the best for producing the, uh, I mean, uh, as the best forest for producing elephants that were uh, fit for use in war. But let us come to the Manasolosa of the 12th century. Okay, it's a big jump from that up to the 12th century. The Manasolosa uh, is a text attributed to the Western Chalukyan king Somadeva III. Now, interestingly, the Manasolosa has a better knowledge of the distribution of elephants. So here you see the description of the Kalingavana is extended to Dravida Desha. Dravida Desha is obviously the extreme south of the country. Okay, so by the time of the of the Manasolosa, which is 12th century CE they had a better knowledge of the distribution of elephants all over the subcontinent. But more significantly, the Manasolosa adds the Aparantavana to Saurashtravana and Panchavandavana as producing the worst elephants. Now, where is the Aparantavana? Aparantavana is right here. Right? Today, there are no elephants here. The elephants have disappeared, disappeared from the Western Ghats of Maharashtra. Because you go and see the Western Ghats of Maharashtra, Maharashtra Western Ghats have been completely deforested. It's in a very highly degraded state. It really can't support elephants. So, this could perhaps indicate that ecological degradation or whatever that are natural or otherwise that initially was there in the northwest of the country and the Saurashtravana had already extended to the northern western Ghats. Okay. So, this is an ecological insight that we can possibly uh, gain from what these different texts talk about the distribution of the elephant. Okay, ecology. Now, feeding preferences of the elephant have been recorded in many ancient sources. And here the Sangam texts are especially uh, very detailed. The tendency of elephants to uproot trees, strip the bark, feed on several plants, including grasses, bamboo, pith of the palmyra tree, and so on and so forth. And the Sangam texts even talk about, you know, even dry twigs regarded uh, that, you know, during the dry season, the elephants would even feed on dry branches, which we all know today that they do. And in Sri Lanka and in parts of uh, southern India during the dry season, if they don't get uh, fresh green fodder, elephants would free feed on dry branches. Now, this is a statement I found extremely interesting. There is a Sangam text, a poem, which states that when a cow elephant in advanced stage of pregnancy feeds on the tender leafless shoots of bamboo, it aborts the fetus. Today we know from our, you know, a lot of chemical ecology work has been done that young shoots of bamboo and many other plants as an anti-herbivory defense, they produce cyanogenic compounds. So the question I am asking is, is there's probably some truth in this statement is it possible that a, a female, a pregnant female feeding on uh, young shoots of bamboo actually, you know, had experienced uh, toxic levels of uh, cyanogenic compounds, you know, hydrogen cyanide, and therefore the calf, the, uh, the embryo or the fetus is aborted. It's, it's possible. So might, there might be something interesting in this. Elephant-human conflicts, perhaps there aren't too many descriptions, but there are descriptions of the Gajasastra, uh, or, the, uh, or rather uh, uh, um, the Matangalila, which is a, a text which is about a thousand years old and of course the Sangam text which go back to about two thousand years before present. The Gajasastra actually begins with an account of elephants ravaging the crops in the kingdom of Anga. It begins with the people of Anga coming before the king, Romapada, and uh, pleading with the king saying that elephants have come and the wild elephants have come and they damaged all the crops. Please do something about it. Okay. So the king sends all his men out into the into the forest and the fields and rounds up all the elephants and brings them to his palace grounds. Then Sage Palkapya appears, who is the first elephantologist, and he appears before the king and makes a plea with the king to let the elephants back into the forest because he, Palkapya, had wandered among the wild elephants and had observed the life of the elephant. And then he goes on to relate the life of the elephant to the to the king and so on. So that forms the text of the Gajasastra. So elephant-human conflict, you know, not something necessarily new. The Sangam text, the Tamil Sangam text, contain many references to elephants riding crops. 
especially he talks about solitary male elephants leaving their herd and raiding millet fields at night. There are this detailed descriptions of, uh, um, you know, of how people try to scare these elephants away and after some time, you know, they are not able to get these elephants out of their fields, you know, and after in a drunken stupor, they simply go to sleep and then the elephants again sneak back into the crop fields. So I said, nothing much has changed in the land of the Tamils. Even today you go to all the hill forests, it's exactly the same thing takes place. You know, the solitary male elephants, they have a higher tendency to raid crops. We all know that from modern biological studies. And then people get fed up after some time. They have the treetop platforms. They have you know, already had a lot of areca or whatever. And they go to sleep and the elephants continue to, continue to feed. So there are obviously some very interesting uh, descriptions of elephant-human conflict in ancient texts. Many ancient texts rec recognize the individual behavioral traits of elephants. We know today that elephants are highly, highly intelligent, very sensitive, with high levels of cognition. There are differences in the individual behavior of elephants. They have their own personalities and so on and so forth. The Arthasastra recognizes elephants not amenable to training as being mischievous, vicious, genuinely mad, or clever enough to feign madness. <laughs> okay, the sagacity and individual character of the war elephant is a repeating theme. King Puru's Ajax, Datagamini is Kandula who fights a war against uh, Elara and Akbar's Hawaii. Okay, all each of these elephants had their own individual characters. Okay, the Mughals recognized three be behavioral types among their bull elephants based on the Hindu differentiation of dispositions of the human mind. So you have Sat, you have Raj, you have Sat, the elephant, which is handsome, then submissive, moderate in eating, and so on and so forth. Raj, and you have Tam, which is self-willed, destructive, sleepy, and a voracious appetite. So the Mughals also recognized that elephants have their individual temperaments and, and so on and so forth. And they classified all their elephants into one of these three. Okay. Today, you know, chemical ecology is a field by itself among scientists. And I have people here who are, want to work on chemical ecology of elephants and who have done some work already. So the Matangalila of Nilakanta, okay, which is goes traces back to the Gajasastra, takes upon smelling their own dung and urine. Let them always be producing a tickling of the palate or an attraction for it. Very strongly referring to some kind of a chemical signal. And the Sanskrit and Tamil Sangam poetry allude to bees hovering around the rut of a bull elephant to gather sweetness from the temples of young must mates. Now I brought this uh, Matangalila to the notice of Bets Rasmussen, who was, uh, unfortunately she is no, no more. She is one of the foremost uh, uh, scientists on the chemical ecology of elephants. And she teamed up with uh, Krishnamurti, an Indian veterinarian, about more than f about 15 years ago, and actually collected the mass secretion of young adult males at Mudumalai and showed that it was qualitative different from that of old adult males. So young males secreted, uh, secreted sweet-smelling alcohols and ketones and acetates, just like what the ancient text described, while old males secreted foul-smelling non-anone ketones and so on and so forth and frontalin. So there was a qualitative difference in the nature of the secretion of these compounds. And they actually published a paper in uh, the journal Nature in 2002, in which they say that the moda must emanations of young maturing males as poetically observed by the ancient Hindus had now been substantiated by modern scientific techniques. So this was published in no, no, no less a journal than Nature. Now you'll see that must is an obsession in ancient times. It's an ancient obsession. You look at any artistic depiction of the elephant, Except for the Indus seals, I don't know if Subani has looked at it closely. I'm not able to make out. It's too small for me to, for me to make out. Okay, this is a real bull elephant in Mast in uh, uh, Rajaji in the north. You look at uh, uh, at uh, uh, Ashoka's Gajatame Supreme Elephant from in Kalsi. There's a rock inscription of the third century BCE. Okay, very clearly, if you look at this, okay, there are these lines coming from the temple gland, very clearly indicating that this is a, the supreme elephant is also an elephant in Mast. Okay, I've seen this rock. I've, the photograph that I have taken, unfortunately, it's not coming out probably too clearly here. But look at the photograph; you can clearly see the lines indicating mass. So the supreme elephant is a bull elephant in mass. This is my favorite elephant sculpture of all times. This must be this elephant must be more perfect than a real elephant. I can't see a, a Kumaria Band elephant, you know, as perfect as this. And uh, you know, we just had this mention of an elephant lifting its foot and being in motion. I can't see a better depiction of that than from the cow elephant behind this. This is as natural a scene that you, as you can ever get. But please take careful note of this. Do you see this little swelling here? Do you see a little in the, you know, this is a master sculptor. This is a master sculptor. 
Can you can you see this little rounded temporal gland here between the eye and the ear? Okay. I don't think any historian of art has actually noticed this. this is a bull elephant in mast. You know, masterfully carved on, on, on in, at Mamalapuram, which is in, near Chennai. You know, not very far from Bangalore. And of course, we have the mast, the bull of uh, Emperor Akbar Hawaii, and he rebelled in in taming the fiercest uh, bull elephants in mast. Now, what did the ancients know about elephants in mast? Excitement. Swiftness, odor, love, passion, complete fluorescence of the body, wrath, prowess, and fearlessness are declared to be the eight excellences of must. The Matan Leela. That single sentence captures what we all modern biologists know about must and the elephant. I hope that Karpagam will be able to improve upon this definition of must. I mean, she's been studying bull, bulls and must for several years and she wants to continue to study this. But I hope that we can improve upon this. But this single sentence captures everything that we know about must and elephants. Okay. I think in the interest of time, I'll just uh, skip some of the... And the Sangam texts also talk a lot about the must in elephants and so on. And must has, uh, and this passage I must uh, quote from the Aini Akbari of Abul Fazal. The Badar ruts in Mad Libra. Bad Badar is the robustly built elephant you, you know, fit for use in war. That is, uh, you know, at the end of the rainy season, must uh, occurs at the end of the rainy season, September, October, Scorpio. Okay, this is when a bull elephant can be expected to be in really good body condition, which kind of roughly corroborates. The meal is a, uh, is a lanky elephant in Capricorn, Sagittarius, and Mir in any season. So Joyce Pohl, in fact, has used game theory to argue that spacing out of must among older dominant bulls and younger subordinate bulls was a mechanism of conflict avoidance. So these kind of passages mean that there were ancient observers who knew that uh, you know, they didn't perhaps did not know the significance of this, but uh, they had made very detailed observations on must and elephants. Now capture of elephants, there are very detailed descriptions in ancient texts which I'll not go into. And uh, the Arthasastra actually prescribes that tusked elephants are captured. And therefore, in the Northeast, for instance, you probably have one of the reasons a lot of tuskless males that you see on the right because of the selective capture of tusked males. The methods of capture, you know, again, in fair amount of detail, you have Megasthenes, you have Arthasastra, you have the Sangam text, the Matangalila, the Aini Akbari, all the different methods of, of capturing elephants. A uh, lot of detailed descriptions. The training and management in captivity, and typically in morphology, anatomy, the training steps, the diet, the treatment of ailments and diseases, these are the kinds of descriptions that you find. Simply because there is a very need for it. A lot of the ancient knowledge of elephants is based on captive elephants. Because people had to maintain large numbers of elephants for use in war, you know, for use in battle and so on and so forth. And the whole knowledge base that built up in ancient times was because of this ancient need to be able to keep elephants in captivity, put them to human use and to use them in the battlefield effectively. So a lot, a lot of a big body of knowledge largely developed around this uh, around this ancient need. The management of elephants in the Mauryan period set up sanctuaries and imposed the death penalty on anyone killing an elephant, much like in modern times or wildlife protection laws and so on. But then by the Manasolasa, there is a very interesting change. You know, it says the Manasolasa repeats the assertion of the Arthasastra that an elephant forest is the best type of forest, but the rider that the king should protect it with the help of forest dwellers. Aha. This is a bit like, uh, you know, the modern debates about whether uh, we should have participatory wildlife management, whether tribals and other people should also help or participate in wildlife management or not. So there's a paradigm shift. So there are some very interesting debates going on in ancient times, also about how do we manage elephant populations. And I think this is my last slide is that, you know, during the colonial period, we had uh, the forest reserves to extract timber. So we had the whole uh, uh, scientific management of the timber elephants, the need for it. There was um, this landmark treatise on elephants by, by Evans, which was first, uh, I think the first version of this came out in 1901, that uh, enunciated, uh, enunciated the European veterinary science of the elephant, drawing upon local traditions. And then we had sport hunting and game, and game preserves being set up for that. And knowledge of anatomy was very important because for the big game hunters to shoot an elephant effectively. So the knowledge of anatomy again advanced. Uh, during the colonial times, apart from the veterinary practice of how do you maintain elephants, and treat their diseases and so on and so forth. And this landmark treatise by G. H. Evans that came up at that time. Okay, so thank you. This is uh, just my, to advertise my book, which I have three copies of it at a heavily discounted price for, especially for visitors from abroad. If anybody needs it, I have three copies with me and I'll be happy to give that to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Very much.